Um, our next speaker uh, is uh, uh, Mustafa uh, Safai, and um, he will. Um, he's, uh, he's recently finished his uh, PhD, uh, so congratulations in uh, uh, David Robbes lab in uh, Marseille. So next to next to Thomas, uh, uh, and during his PhD, uh, Mustafa studied uh, embodied strategies for timing and the contribution of the dorsal striatum to those strategies. And his, um, his presentation is, um, is the second part of his PhD work. And uh, very soon he will uh, join uh, Juan Gallego's lab at Imperial College in London as a postdoc to study uh, motor skills and the role of cortical striatal pathway. So uh, good luck for, with, the, with the postdoc and good luck with the, with the talk. So the floor is yours. All right. Uh, thank you, Alberto. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, uh, today I will uh, present uh, part of my PhD work about uh, the dorsal striatum's role in uh, energizing motor routines. But before getting to it, maybe uh, first uh, it's better to review the high current hypothesis in the field about the role of the dorsal striatum. Generally, there are two, two hypotheses. One is action selection, uh, proposing that uh, the direct pathway promotes an appropriate action while the indirect pathway of the basal ganglia suppresses competing ones. For instance, in this example, uh, we can see that both direct and indirect pathway activity increases right before a motor sequence. An alternative idea is um, that uh, uh, direct and indirect pathways uh, bidirectionally control the speed of movement. For instance, in this example, on the left panel, we can see that uh, direct pathway stimulation increases uh, locomotion, while indirect pathway stimulation um, decreases motor activity. But uh, to te to testing uh, this hypothesis is a bit complicated because uh, using um, neural manipulation techniques usually leads to what is called performance confound, meaning that if we see a performance loss, it could be either due to an impaired memory or selection mechanism with an intact, intact uh, execution ability, or it could be due to impaired execution ability with, a, with an intact uh, memory or selection. And it's difficult to tell these two apart. So to do just that, we use uh, several behavioral uh, tasks that I'm going to explain here uh, is a trained animal on a motorized treadmill. And the task is just to, to wait for seven seconds before approaching the reward. If the animal approaches the reward too early, there's gonna be a penalty and no reward. If too late, there's gonna be a smaller reward. And what majority of animals develop is what we call this wait and run routine, which includes a starting from the front, waiting more or less immobile until the treadmill carries them to the back, as just, we just saw, and then accelerating forward and crossing the treadmill to get the reward. So this is like the typical trajectory that we see in each trial, starting from the front, waiting while the treadmill carries them, and then running forward and outrunning the treadmill. So now the question is how, what is the contribution of the striatum to this particular routine, the, what we call the wait and run routine. And those two hypotheses predict different phenomena. If it's about speed control, we would expect different speed in the acceleration phase of the routine. And if it's about action selection, we expect uh, a kind of a different sequence of uh, actions during the task. So our experimental setup, our experimental design is, uh, is here. So we, we, uh, we trained animals for at least 30 days, making sure that the performance is stable. And then we lesion different parts of the dorsal striatum, dorsal lateral striatum, dorsal medial striatum, and eventually the entire dorsal striatum. We waited two weeks for the recovery and then we retrained the animals. And finally, we, we perform histology to verify the location of the lesion. And also we uh, quantified the volumetric uh, size of the lesion. Here is an example session. We, uh, on, the on the left, uh, we see the, the session right before lesion. 
and the blue uh, traces show um, routine um, triumphs. And we see that the animal mostly uses the routine. Immediately after the, the lesion in the middle, we, we see that the animal is more or less uh, trying to do the same, but uh, sometimes the starts running maybe too early, but in it, after a couple of more sessions, the animal continues doing basically the same strategy and solving the task similarly. And this is in an animal with a huge complete striatal lesion. At the group level with the large number of animals in each group, we, we, we can see that in terms of entrance time at the top and percentage of routines at, on the bottom, both DLS and DMS animals are basically unaffected. So after the lesion, they perform the task similarly. However, in the group with largest lesions, the DS group, we see a transient effect immediately after the lesion, but animals tend to recover after a few more sessions. However, if you look at the speed, uh, and by speed, I mean the speed with which the animals uh, outrun the treadmill, we see a big, robust and irreversible effect in all, all the groups. And uh, interestingly, this effect, the reduction in the speed, correlates very well with the size of the lesion. So, uh, so far I showed you that uh, after striatal lesion, overall performance in the task is spared. However, speed was irreversibly reduced. But there was also a uh, peculiar uh, transient effect in the DS group. Now, one might argue that this could be due to a loss of routine, which is followed by relearning the routine using a striatal independent system. So to test uh, just that, we use that modified version of the task, identical to the original task. The only difference is that the, the treadmill moves toward the reward instead of away from it. So what this means is that all the animal needs to do is just to go to the back of the treadmill and sit while the treadmill transports it to the, to the reward. So it could be performed basically with a very compromised motor system as well. And that's the behavior that we see animal develop. So during the inter-trial, they go to the back of the treadmill and they just sit while the treadmill transports them to the front. So in this video, the animal is drinking the reward from the previous trial. And then when the reward is finished, he moves slowly to the back of the treadmill and just sits there while the treadmill uh, carries him uh, to the reward. So again, this new, new routine, which is very similar to the original routine, what is a uh, run and wait, and here indicated in blue, before the lesion, most of the, most of the trials animal is using this routine. And interestingly, even after the striatal lesion, the animal is still capable of performing this routine, even in the very first session. And at, at the group level in nine animals, they still perform the, the same routine after a striatal lesion. So this, uh, the first uh, argument does not seem to be the case. So another uh, alternative is that maybe this is also due to the speed deficit that we saw, meaning that uh, in the first session after the lesion, animals were, had a bigger speed deficit that recovered a little bit afterwards, not completely. So to, 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 to uh, understand better the origin of this uh, speed deficit, we, we consider different possibilities. It could be due to a, a reward seeking uh, deficit or a basic locomotion problem, or maybe animals just cannot run uh, at fast speed, or maybe they cannot control their locomotion speed, or for the sake of argument, it could be due to the two-week two break after the solution surgery. Uh, today, I don't have time to present the last two, but let's quickly look at the first three possibilities. We recorded the licking behavior of animals, before the before lesion and after lesion, and we can see that it's more or less similar. The number of leaks and also the frequency of leaks is not affected after the lesion. So reward seeking seems to be uh, intact. Also, if you put the animal in a novel environment and record the locomotion, the, the, the both control and lesion animals seem to have similar uh, level, similar, similar amount of uh, exploration which suggests the basic locomotor activity is also unaffected. And if you force the animals uh, without any reward or anything, just we force them to run on a treadmill with increasing speeds, lesioned animals can keep up 
although maybe they, they tend to be a, a little bit slower, but they can keep up with much faster speeds. So none of these uh, explanations seem to be the case. So uh, we think that the most parsimonious ex uh, explanation of our data is that animals actually prefer running at a slower speed. And this is in line with uh, this great paper in Parkinsonian patients, where authors uh, show that movements with a lower energy expenditure are favored, although a repertoire of normal movements is available. So Stefania, who is a computational neuroscientist in the lab, we use optimal control theory to find the optimal strategy in our task. I don't have time to, to go through the modeling part, and, uh, but basically she showed that uh, increasing the effort sensitivity in the model or the sensitivity to energy expenditure causes the animals to start running uh, earlier. So the red the trajectory is in this plot. So they wait, wait less and uh, have a reduced maximum position. And this was something that we had noticed in our data. Here, if you compare before and, verse, uh, and after lesion, just the median trajectories, we can see that not only animals after lesion are slower, indicated by the slope of the trajectory, but also they start running earlier. So we look for we look for this in our database, and indeed we found that uh, post lesion animals uh, tend to have a shorter maximum positions, meaning that they start running earlier. And this is also an effect that is uh, not reversible. No matter how much we, we train them after lesion, they still tend to do this. And also this effect correlates very well with the size of their lesion. And although this effect is a small, but uh, if we just look at the absolute value of maximum uh, position in all of our database, so in more than 100 legend animals, we can see that this effect is still significant. So in conclusion, uh, I, uh, I hope I showed convincing evidence that the striatal lesions uh, did not prevent execution of a learned motor routine. However, they increased the sensitivity to energy expenditure or effort while preserving loc locomotion speed modulation, preserving uh, locomotion speed range, and reward-seeking behavior. And if you're interested in this work, uh, I just summarized this paper that was recently published, and uh, you can have a look for to, to see more analysis and more data. And uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to also thank uh, all the members of the team, David, my supervisor, and uh, especially Teresa and Estefania, my, Estefania, my two co-first authors in that paper. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mustafa, for uh, your, uh, your nice presentation. And I see some similar background in, the, in this last a group picture and uh, the one from uh, Toma, uh, and also some um, common topics, of course, in the in your your presentation. Mm -hmm. So um, we we have um, uh, we have already two questions. Um, the first one is from uh, Josefa. Uh, nice talk. Uh, could you give me uh, more experimental details on uh, how to measure the volume of the lesion? Yeah, so we do uh, immunohistochemistry on uh, coronal sections, and then in each section we outline manually um, the striatum and also the um, the lesion, and uh, considering the rostrocortal distance of those sections, we can uh, we can estimate the size of the lesion and size of the striatum by uh, uh, approximating it basically by having uh, like a, uh, imagining a truncated cone basically between each two consecutive uh, sections. And the values that I showed you is just the ratio of uh, lesion size versus uh, over uh, striata size. Okay, thank you. Uh, then we have uh, another question from um, uh, Faiz. Uh, I might miss uh, part of your talk. Is the uh, treadmill run at a constant speed across the trials or at different speed? Yeah, it's always constant at 10 centimeters per second. And but this, this, in this presentation, everything that I talked about 
the speed of the treadmill is constant and it's uh, 10 centimeters per second. I see. I, I think having a, a variable speed could have uh, been uh, another confounding factor that could um, yeah, make things <laughs> more difficult uh, yeah. than they already yeah, are. Well, we have also data on that, and it's uh, on the, the other part of the work that is more concerned about time uh, timing mechanism. And in that part, it's also published if, if you're interested. Uh, we do play with the, uh, with the speed and we vary, vary speed between trials to see how animals can adapt their timing performance. But here, yeah, that would be a confounding factor. So it's always uh, the same. Uh -huh. Thank you, thank you very much. And then I see that among our attendees,